Good morning, brothers and sisters. What a wonderful day. We are so blessed to be in the house of the Lord. Amen to that. Amen. Um, I'm going to read a familiar scripture. If maybe most of us, if not all, may know it even by heart. It's um, Psalm 23, the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen to his word. In this psalm, uh, we learn about the shepherd who is our Lord and Savior. Um, sheep are known to be defense, uh, defenseless animals um, that are prone to get lost, and they need almost um, constant care. You cannot drive sheep as you do cattle. They need, they must be led. In this psalm, David explains that if we follow the Lord and trust him, he will meet our every need, no matter what the circumstances may be. Just as a shepherd leads sheep to food, to rest, and water. Our shepherd is a provider and protector. The green pastures and still waters indicate an abundant blessing. This shepherd is also a restorer of my soul. We are sinners, but Christ redeemed us, and he continues to restore us upon repentance. We are not to be afraid because our shepherd will guide us, and even in times of darkness, he will be our light. Even amongst our enemies, we can have complete confidence. He anoints us with an overflow, a cup running over. As long as we follow Christ, goodness and mercies shall follow us all, not some days, but all the days of our lives. Amen. Mercies and goodness are for each day. Joy and peace is for each day, regardless of our circumstances. So we want to trust in the word of God. We believe in his truth, and we give him the glory. Let us pray. Lord God, I just want to thank you for your word. I thank you that it's so true, my Lord, that you are our shepherd. I thank you that we can lean on you, Lord God. In times of rest, we can come to you, and you give us perfect peace and perfect rest. Thank you, Lord God, that your rod and your staff, they guide and they protect us, my Lord and my Savior. We shall not fear, my Lord and my God, because fear is not of you, Lord God, but love, peace, and joy. So this moment, Lord God, we just want to reflect on that which you have freely given to us, Lord God. You tell us that this peace the world does not understand, but we do, because peace is within us. It starts from deep within, where the Holy Spirit dwells, in our temple, Lord God. It's regardless of our circumstances, Lord God, we can walk on the water, we can walk above our circumstances, as long as we look to you, Lord God. So this moment we declare, my Lord and my Savior, that we look to you, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray and give you the glory. Amen and amen. Hi, I'm Craig Matheson, pastor of Changing Lives Christian Church. I hope you're having a fantastic day today. I just want to share for a couple of minutes something that we're offering you free of charge, postage paid, and that our ministry would like to send to you for us to be a blessing to you. And we want to thank you for watching us here on community television, as well as YouTube and through the internet as well in our church services. Each Saturday morning, what we do is we meet here at the church, a few members meet here at the church, and we are distributing these door hangers to approximately 100 people per week. So far, we've distributed about 1,100 of these. We're inviting people to our church. Our church is uh, fairly new, or at least this location where we're meeting is fairly new. Our church is actually 20 years old. I've been pastoring this church for approximately 20 years. We had a situation that had happened where, where we had a fire 
in Methuen. We were located in Methuen, Massachusetts on Prospect Street for years and about 18, uh, 19 years there and we had a, a, unfortunately an electrical fire and after that fire happened we were meeting at a hotel. Uh, our congregation was meeting at a hotel for approximately a year and then this building became available here at 17 Newcomb Street. We find it a real blessing to be here and so we purchased this particular building. We thank God for his providence in leading us here at this particular location. But what we're doing is we're inviting folks, being fairly new to this area, to our church. How we're doing that is we're, doing these, uh, we're passing these door hangers out, about 100 per week. And basically the door hanger says, you are invited to the new church in town, Changing Lives Christian Church. And then it gives information about our church and so forth. And what we're offering inside these door hangers as well is a free Gospel of John in Book of Romans booklet and a pocket calendar as well as a little Bible track. The little Bible track in here is called the Romans Road and it basically explains the plan of salvation for somebody that doesn't know how to be saved, how to accept Jesus as, as their personal Lord and Savior, how to have a relationship with God through Christ. It also has this Bible, the Good News Bible, the Gospel of John in the Book of Romans. And uh, inside it, it also explains the plan of salvation in the back of that book, little uh, Bible booklet, and also a little 2015 uh, pocket calendar as well. And so we're offering these for free. And what I felt led of the Lord to do is to have this little, um, this little spot here on our uh, community television station and so forth and to offer you for free these materials. If you have not received one yet, we've pressed, um, distributed about 1,100 of these so far in the city of Havel. We're going every week and again, we're, we're passing out about 100 of them, uh, distributing them to uh, each uh, folks house here in the city of Havel. So if you'd like one, please, they're, they're totally free, postage paid. We're not going to put you on a mailing list or anything like that. The address is there on the screen. Either write, um, which is Changing Lives Christian Church, 17 Newcomb Street, Havel, Mass. The zip code is 01830. Or the email address is info at changinglivesChristianChurch.com. And if you send your, uh, your um, address, we can mail these out to you immediately. Or you could just give us a call at 978-373-7373. Again, postage paid, free of charge. We're not asking you for anything. We just want to be a blessing to you. And if you don't have a little Bible in your home and so forth, this would be a great opportunity to get one of these. And we want to thank you for watching here at Changing Lives Christian Church, our services, both on community television as well as YouTube and also throughout the Internet. God bless you. Praise God. I invite you to stand on your feet at this time in reverence to the Lord. And to open your Bibles to the book of um, Colossians chapter 1 in the Word of God. Colossians chapter 1 in the Word of God. Uh, Children's Church is dismissed at this time. Um, last week I started a message concerning who I am in Christ and how basically this message is about how to overcome a low self-esteem. Amen. And uh, let me read Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 in the Word of God. And I'm reading the New Living Translation. The Bible tells us, Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Kings, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. Everything has been created through him and for him. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for the message today. I pray that every one of us, Lord God, in Jesus' name, who are struggling with a low self-esteem, would really hear this message with the hearts. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that we know who we are in Christ Jesus, so that we can hold our heads high, and that, Lord, we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ with lost and dying souls. We want to thank you for every person that's here today. I pray that you'd bless every single one of us, Lord, and we thank you for that, Father God. Minister to us through your word, and we magnify your name, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise God. The Bible says in the message version of the Bible, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, and I'm going to do a little bit of catch-up if you weren't here last week. Amen. I'm going to kind of do a quick review, and then today I'd like to give you specific scriptures of what the word of God tells us who we are in Christ Jesus. And um, you know how sometimes people say, well, don't take it personally, but I want you to take this message personally of what God says about you, of what God says about me. Amen? And if we really, really know who we are in Christ, how many of you know we're going to have the victory? 
So Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 in the message version of the Bible, it says, For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. Praise God. How many know everything finds and everyone finds their purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ? The thing that I have a tough time understanding is how somebody can live without Jesus in their life. How somebody can live and have, you know, obviously the pro same problems that we have, the same issues, situations, but yet have nobody to go to. They, they don't believe in God, so they don't go to the, the Lord in prayer. Amen? So how many of you know, praise God, God is an awesome God, and we can go to Him. Life is about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Now, low self-esteem, I mentioned last week, and I'll say it again today uh, in review, can manifest itself in many different ways. It could be feelings of self-hate, believing that we are unworthy or incompetent, refusal to get close to people, believing we don't deserve strong or supportive relationships, refusal to trust others, inability to accept ourselves as special and unique, rejection of what God intended the person to be in him. It could cause depression, suicidal thoughts, a need for large amounts of attention in some cases, a competitive or argumentative spirit, poor decisions made that are based on fears and not reality. An individual's self-esteem is in trouble when he allows others to determine his value or significance instead of the one who created him. You know, that's a mistake we get sometimes in our lives. Somebody may tell us, well, you, you know, you'll never add up to anything. You're a C student, so therefore you're, you're an average student. You'll never, ever attain anything in life. Or somebody may say to us, well, you're kind of ugly. You're not very attractive. You'll never add up to anything in life. Or somebody might say, well... You know, I, you know I, I don't really think that you're, you have a lot of value or you're not very significant, but how many of those all people with their own personal evaluations and their own minds and their own stereotypes and so forth as far as what they're trying to project upon you? Somebody may look at somebody and say, you remind me of someone that I didn't like a few years ago, therefore, I don't like you. Or somebody might say, well, I don't like people that wear glasses. So, Pastor Craig, I don't like you. You know what I'm saying? Follow me? We've got to not receive what other people say about us, but we've got to receive what God says about us. Amen? Amen? We've got to say, Lord, what do you say about me? You have created me, and therefore I am going to receive what you say about me. Now, God has determined our value based on his love and purpose for creating us in the first place and on the price he has paid to redeem us for all of eternity. Isn't that awesome? If you ever think, well, God doesn't love me, you think of the cross and Jesus dying on the cross just for you. If you ever think, well, you know, I'll never add up to anything, you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If anybody ever tells you, well, you're ugly, no, I am a beautiful creation from Christ Jesus. I am his masterpiece. If anybody ever says, you're stupid, no, I'm very intelligent. I'm very wise, the Bible says, because I am winning souls to the Lord. The Bible says, you know, people may say negative things to you, amen, but how many of you know, praise God, we've got to receive what the Word of God says about us. But not only in our noggin, in other words, in our head, we've got to receive it in our heart and live according to that, Amen. Every human being has a great need to be loved, accepted, to feel significant, and to be secure in life. The only way we can truly have and feel these things is to be what God has created us to be. First and foremost, to have a personal relationship with Him. Without this, we will always have a void and emptiness in our lives and wonder, what is my purpose in life? Many people are physically born, they don't know the Lord as they grow up and so forth, and they say, why was I born? What am I even doing here? Why am I here? You see, if you don't know your creator, you're not going to know what you're, uh, what, why you're here. I use a weird analogy. You know the Maytag commercials for Maytag dishwashers? You know, the guy's standing there, he's pretending to be a dishwasher, and this lady's over there, and she's loading all kinds of stuff on him, and he's over there holding everything, all the dirty dishes. He pretends he's the dishwasher. Amen? Well, let's say this. If a Maytag dishwasher had a brain, and if the Maytag dishwasher did not know what its purpose was, therefore, it would never, ever wash any dishes. 
because it doesn't know its maker. Why was I made? You were made Maytag dishwasher in order to wash dishes. That's your purpose. You're, you're made to make it easier for human beings so they don't have to go to their sink and wash their own dishes by hand. They can go to their sink and rinse off the dishes, put them inside of you, Maytag dishwasher, and push a button and a little bit of soap in there, and then you're going to clean all these dishes through a few cycles of different water and so forth, spraying on all those dishes. If we don't know our maker, our manufacturer, that is God, personally, how are we going to know our purpose? We won't even know what we're created for. So there's a lot of people in the world, they don't know the Lord and they have excuses why they don't want to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and their Savior. There are other people who have told me even within the last few weeks, I know I've got to come back to church, Pastor. I know I've got to serve God again. I haven't been there for years and years and I encourage them to come, but yet it's their decision not to be here. Amen? Nobody's going to drive up to your house and take a chain and put it around your neck and say, you're coming to church whether you like it or not. Isn't that right? We come into church because we're encouraged. We come into church because it's a, it's a really good habit. We come into church to praise God, to worship Him. We come into church to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? It's important to have a local church that we belong to, that we're part of, amen, that we support, praise God, that we attend, and that we say, Lord, I praise you and I worship you and I magnify your name in that place on Sunday. Even many people who have a personal relationship with God, that is Christians, still struggle with a lack of peace. They feel insecure, feel insignificant, not accepted and unloved. Why is this? Because it's very simple, church. They don't know who they are in Christ. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says in the word of God, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How many know if we don't study the word of God and accept what God says about us, we're not going to receive it? Amen? We've got to say, Lord, I am going to accept your word. I am going to receive what you say about me. I am not going to believe that you're this God up in heaven with the baseball bat, ready to judge me and slap me over the head every time I say or do something wrong. I'm going to believe that you're a loving God. I'm going to believe that when I do blow it, say something wrong and sin, or whatever the case is, that I'm going to come to you as my Heavenly Father, and I'm going to confess to you what I have done, and I'm going to ask you, Lord, help me to get over this. Help me to repent from this. Amen. And our Heavenly Father is going to hug us and hold us in His arms and say, yes, I am here for you, and I'm going to help you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God is a great God. God is not a God with a bunch of rules on the wall. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Or else, or else, or else, or else. <laughs> Amen. Our God is not a legalistic God. Our God is a loving God. However, our God is also a God who is our judge. He's someone who we will stand before him one day and give an account for everything we said or done. Because Jesus, once the day we were born again, we have given our lives to the Lord and how many you know that he has bought us back or redeemed us? Amen. Therefore, we're on his time clock, not our own. And he's going to say, as a Christian, what did you do? What did you say for me? Many people will go there and they'll say, Lord, I had a career and I made this amount of money and I paid this amount of money on my taxes and, and I did it. He's going to say, I don't care about none of that. What did you do for me? Well, Lord, I mean, I vacuumed the church a few times. Okay, you vacuumed my house. That's important. Well, Lord, I went to Bible study and I, you know, prayed for the pastor and, and I, well, that's important because that's for me. You see what I mean? I gave my first fruit of my income, my tithe to you. That's important because that's for me. What have we done for Christ? Amen? Because whatever we do for Christ will last. Everything else will just pass. Amen? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11, verse 11, the first part of that scripture says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. It's who? In Christ to find out who we are and what we are living for. Now, church, many Christians who do not know who they are in Christ attach themselves to relationships in order to try to solve the problem of low self-esteem and compromise their relationship with God in sin as a result of it. How many of you know, praise God, that as a believer in Christ, you've got to stand up and say, if any relationship in my life is going to make me compromise my relationship with God, it's got to be shut down. If somebody's going to be use control tactics and tell me that if you don't sleep with me, then I am, I'm going to break up with you when it's all over, you've got to, you, you're in the valley of decision. It's either Jesus or that person. 
You can't have both. Amen? Others attach themselves to money, career, having a title to feel important, or somehow to make someone love them through achieving an important title or position in a job, such as a doctor, lawyer, etc. Nothing wrong with being a doctor, nothing wrong with being a surgeon, nothing wrong with being a lawyer. None of these things are wrong. It's just that if you have the wrong motive, that I've, I've you know, people don't love me, so I'm going to impress people, so I have to have a title. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to med school because I'm going to become a doctor. Then people are finally going to look up to me when they hear that I am a doctor. See, that's the wrong motive. On the other hand, if you really want to be a doctor and you really want to help people, that's great. Go for it. Amen. Nothing wrong with being a doctor. Praise God. But it's what the motive is behind it. Amen. If a person says, I'm going to get my PhD, I'm going to, get a school, go, to school to get my PhD, nothing wrong with that. But if they're only doing that to impress other people because they have a lack of love and they haven't realized that God loves them unconditionally, that's the wrong motive for doing it. Amen. Amen. So we have to ask ourselves a question, a very simple question. How was life designed to be lived? What is it supposed to actually look like? Amen. Many people say, what is everyday life supposed to look like in the Christian's life? Well, first of all, like I said, we've got to know who we are in Christ Jesus how we relate to other people concerning our esteem, how we feel about ourselves is very important. Sometimes we might, as I said earlier, withdraw from people because we have a low self-esteem. Well, I'm not good enough. Well, I get picked on in school. And all the kids in elementary school, they picked on me. They called me all names. So therefore, as a result of that, with all those messages, I have a low self-esteem. But we've got to say, Lord God in heaven, you have created me. You knew the beginning from the end of my entire life. And Lord God, I receive what you say in your word concerning who I am. Now, let me go over the scriptures one by one. And if you want a copy of this outline, you just let me know and I'll definitely provide you a copy of it. Amen? The first thing is, I am accepted. How many of you know every single person in life has a desire to be accepted? Many people, they feel rejected. They feel like I don't fit in. I just don't fit in with any crowd. I go and I feel like I'm just, you know, it's awkward. I don't really fit in. But how many of you know we have that, that desire to be accepted? We have to say that I am God's child. Amen? John chapter 1 verse 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So you can say, I am a child of God. If somebody says, who is your father? What does he do for a living? Well, basically, he runs the universe. He, he rises the sun every single day. He sets the sun every single day. He gives me oxygen to breathe. He keeps my heart beating. He's created me. He's given me a great future and a great hope. Wow, who is this guy? His name's God. He's because I'm a child of Almighty God. Amen? Next is, as a disciple, I am a friend of Jesus Christ. John chapter 15, verse 15 says, Jesus' words, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. So, you know, we sing that song, I am a friend of God sometimes. That's where that scripture comes from, John 15, 15. We are a friend of God. Now, I'll tell you what. If you say, well, I don't have any friends. Are you a Christian? Yes. Then you do have a friend, a really good one at that. Amen. And his name's Jesus. Amen. Amen? How many know our best friend is Jesus? Amen. He's our best friend. Let me tell you something about Jesus. His friendship. He will never leave nor forsake you. He's never going to say an evil word about you. He's never going to slap you over the head. He's never going to say, okay, I'll be there for an appointment and, and blow you off and not show up. He is somebody who's going to be there all the time, and you can count 100% on him. You can tell Jesus everything about your life, all the bad, all the good, and he's not going to look at you and say, shame on you. Amen? He's an awesome. Somebody say, Jesus is my awesome friend. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody once said, you know, I'm going to go out for a cup of coffee with my friend. Really? And then they, they, one day they walked in the, the cafe and they saw that person sitting there alone with their Bible in front of them. And they said, where's your friend? He's right there. <laughs> it's Jesus. He's, he's, I'm having a cup of coffee with Jesus. Amen? You know, I honestly think that if Jesus was alive right now in the flesh, he'd love Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> 
Amen? Praise God, you know? I mean, you know, it's awesome. God is so good. First of all, you know, he'd, go to dunk, you know he, he'd visit Dunkin' Donuts to give you a dunk, baptize you, then he'd go to Heavenly Donuts. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just a little weird joke, but anyway. Who knows? But how many know God is an awesome God? Amen. He is awesome, amen? You know, I believe that, honestly, if Jesus was alive today with his disciples on a Sunday afternoon after church, I really can picture him in the backyard somewhere just throwing around a football. Hey, John, catch! You know what I mean? I really do. I think he's cool. I, think, I, I, I don't think he's this guy with the halo. Mm, I don't think that's Jesus at all. I'm sorry. That's religion. Amen? I, I think that he's awesome. Amen? Praise God. You can talk to him. Amen? Sometimes he looks at you and shakes his head and goes, oh, man, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you know, joking around and stuff like that. He's an awesome God. Amen. We can talk to him. We can share things with him. He's there with us. Amen. He wants what's best for us. Amen. The absolute best. Praise be to God. Don't settle for a hot dog when you got prime ribs sitting right in front of you. Amen. Now, somebody say, I've been justified. We talked about this word specifically in Bible study. This word is justified. It's a court term. Just as if I had not sinned. We took a, a, a whiteboard and we broke it down. We, J-U-S-T, then I made a dash. I, then I made another dash. I-F, then I made another dash. Just as if I, and you can add on, hadn't done it. Justified. Why are we justified? Not because of any of our goodness. Not, not because, you know, whatever, because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, we're justified. We're justified, amen? God the Father is the judge. Satan is the prosecuting attorney. And he says, Craig has sinned, therefore he deserves hell. He's got to pay for it, God the Father. And then God the Father looks and he sees his son, Jesus Christ, as my defense attorney. And he says, Craig has accepted my son's payment already on the cross for his sin. Therefore, he has been justified. Just as if he hadn't sinned. He had really sinned, yes, we're not in denial of that, but because he received my son in his blood shed on the cross, who's already paid the price for him, he's been justified. Therefore, not guilty. Next case. <laughs> Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Next. I am united with the Lord, and I am one with him in spirit. Somebody say, I'm united with the Lord. First Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Oh, praise God. Amen. Next, I have been bought with a price and I belong to God. Look at this, what the Bible says. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Somebody say, I am not my own. That means we don't own ourselves. We don't call the shots what we do or don't do. We, we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ because we're not our own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Amen? Somebody say, my body's special. Amen. I mean, you know, we shouldn't be doing evil things with our bodies. Hello? Praise God. I am a member of Christ's body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 says, you are, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. How many know we're part of the body of Christ? Isn't that awesome? Praise God. I have been chosen by God and adopted as his child. You've been adopted as his child. You've been chosen by God. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 in the NIV version. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Think about all the promises that I just read. 
Isn't that awesome that our God loves us that much? We've been chosen by him. When do we be? What, when we were physically born, when we were a little baby? No, before the creation of the world. How many thousands of years do you have to go back for the creation of the world? God chose us in him before that was even created. Do you know that before he created the earth, the heavens and the earth, he had you on his mind? That's really something else, amen? Praise God, he had us on his mind. You know, sometimes, you know, somebody, somebody comes into this, this earth or whatever the case is, they say, oh, I'm a mistake. I should have never been born. Uh, I'm, I'm a result of this or I'm a result of that. Or mom, you know, mom and dad kind of slipped up when they had me. You know, they didn't really plan on having me, but they slipped up and here I am. You're not a mistake. God is the one who ordained you to be born. How you got here is irrelevant. God wanted you here and you are here. God is such an awesome God, amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I feel good about the Lord right now. Amen. Next, I have been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. Somebody say, all my sins. Oh. Now, we got to understand something here, because I used to think as a new Christian that, wait a minute, my past sins are forgiven because I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but my present and my future sins are not forgiven. Wrong. All of our sins have been forgiven. Amen. Now, should we take advantage of God and say, well, I'm going to sin tomorrow at 2 o'clock and 2.05, I'll repent from it? No, we should not. Because that's taking advantage of God's grace. That's slapping him in the face. That's saying, I don't respect you at all. I don't care that you died on the cross, Jesus, and shed your blood for my sins. That's when we need, if we have that attitude, that rebellious attitude, we've got to sit down and watch the passion of the Christ. And we've got to take a look and, and remind ourselves what Jesus went through for us because of our sin. But our sins have been forgiven past, present, and future. Somebody say that's good news. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 in the word. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Somebody say, I am forgiven. Now, when we do sin, what are we supposed to do with that? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says what? If we confess our sins, he is what? Just and will forgive us for our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of the verses before that says that if we say we have no sin, we are liars. It, it uses the term liars, amen? So how many you know, you know some Christians go around, hey, I've never sinned, praise God. I, I, you know, I'm... I'm totally righteous. I have never sinned. The Bible says that you're a liar. Because 1 first, first John was written to Christians. Amen? So we have to know and understand, praise God. But, you know, we can't, on the other hand, you know, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's, you know, Romans, uh, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. So we can't take advantage of God and, and continue to sin and say, who cares, you know? Repentance means a change of mind, a change of heart, that I'm going to make changes in my life because I don't want to keep on going down this road of sin. Amen. Amen? Next is, I am complete in Christ. The other day, I decided to make homemade Chinese food. I love to cook. Now, you've got to understand, when you make homemade Chinese food, it takes an entire day. It took me about seven hours. I started at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I, I got done maybe 4, 4.30 when it was on the table. What takes all the time, Pastor Craig? Well, I chose to make crab rangoons, one of the recipes. Where are you getting this complete in Christ? How does that tie into this? I'll let you know in a minute. Crab rangoons take a long time to make. First of all, you know, you've got to use, uh, use cream cheese, eight ounces of that. You've got to soften the cream cheese. You've got to put soy sauce in it, maybe some Worcestershire sauce in it. You obviously have to put your crab meat in it, and you've got to mix it around in a mixer and so forth, and a few other spices. Then you have to take one little teaspoon, and you have 60 crab rangoon wrappers. They take about two hours to put a little teaspoon of this crab rangoon stuff in the middle of it and then wrap and then put egg white around it, rub it with your finger all, you know, all around the corners, then fold it over, then take a fork and push it down so it doesn't break open when it's in the oil in the fryer. Or else it will splatter all over the place. It will make everything yucky, right? So that takes a lot of time. But then I decided to make fried shrimp. I decided to make fried chicken fingers. And I also decided to make chicken fried rice. Now, two of the items, I said to myself, what kind of batter am I going to put on them in order to put it into this oil, which is canola oil, 
350 degrees, what kind of, what, what batter can I use? So I went to Market Basket that particular morning, and I looked at it, and they had pancake batter that said complete. You are complete in Christ. I didn't have to add in, it said just add water. Now, I could have got other pancake batter they had on the shelf that I would have had to add eggs. I would have had to add a few other ingredients. It was incomplete. So therefore, I would have had to make it complete. But the Bible says that you and I are complete in Christ. Amen? Amen? Just like that pancake batter I used, it was already complete. I didn't want to fool around with eggs and adding anything else in it. I had enough to do with that meal. So it was complete, and that's all I needed. I was excited when I saw complete on the box. Complete. So therefore, we are not just 75% in Christ. We're not just 95% in Christ. We're not just 50% in Christ. We are 100% complete in Christ. Amen? Somebody say, I'm complete in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Amen. Oh, glory to God. We are complete in the Lord. Amen? It's like that pancake batter being complete. We're complete in the Lord. Amen. I have direct access to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. You know, we can go directly to God immediately. We don't have to go to a temple or a synagogue. We don't have to go to the high priest and say, you know something, high priest, I know that you go in there in the Holy of Holies one time a year. Could you go in there and pray for me? We as Christians, that's why the veil was torn in half. Amen? Amen? The veil was torn in half when Jesus died on the cross when he said it is finished. You know what that veil was? You couldn't go behind that or you dropped dead. You're in the presence of God. Now, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, he is our high priest, we can go to him any second of the day, straight to the throne of grace, and pray to him, and God the Father hears us. Amen. We don't have to wait and take a note and write it down and say, well, you know, the high priest is going in there January 1st, i got to wait, you know, let me give him my prayer request. We can go right to the throne of grace. Amen. Isn't that great news? Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Do you know Jesus was tempted in every single way that you and I attempted in? Amen? Yet he did not sin. Well, he wasn't tempted with this, Pastor Craig. That's only me that's tempted with that. Yes, he was. What does it say? Read it. It doesn't say except such and such. Verse 16 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So first of all, everybody say, I am significant. Say, I am accepted. Say, I am secure. Let's look at I am secure for a few minutes. I am free from condemnation. How many you know condemnations of the enemy? Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, how many know when the Holy Spirit convicts us, there's a huge difference between conviction and condemnation? Amen? Conviction is something the Holy Spirit does, and he, and he you know, makes light, light, in other words, shows us our sin and convicts us, meaning that, you know, don't you really think you should confess that? To, to me. Don't you think you confess that to the Lord? Conviction. Condemnation is, you sin, condemnation puts shame on you, condemnation keeps you in it, condemnation is guilt, condemnation is you're bad, you're terrible, you should have never been born, that's condemnation. That's from the enemy. Amen? But if we're walking according to the Spirit, how many you know, praise God, there is now no condemnation? Amen. Praise be to God. Next is, I am assured that God works for me, uh, for my good in all circumstances. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 28, For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So if you're, calling, uh, you're called according to God's purpose, amen, and, and, and you can say, okay, Lord, I know that you work for the good of me. Praise be to God. That's awesome. We can say we can walk in that and have faith in that and, and trust and hope in the Lord. Next, I am free from any condemnation brought against me, and I cannot be separated from the love of God. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Romans 8 and 31 in the Word of God. I got to read this, amen, I don't want to leave this out. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 in the Word, down to verse 39. The Bible says, What can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't God, who gave, up, who gave us Christ, also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Will God? No. He is the one who has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? Will Christ Jesus? No. For he is the one who died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting at the place of the highest honor next to God pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? Even the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels can't and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you know something? There's one thing you can't do. You cannot make God not love you unconditionally. No matter what you do. You can backslide all you want away from God. You can become a devil worshiper. He will not stop loving you. Does he want you to be a devil worshiper? No, absolutely, positively not. Does he want you to backslide away from him? Absolutely not. He loves you. One person said it this way. If you choose to go to hell, he'll love you straight there. His love is not going to change. One problem we get into is we think that, okay, I sinned, so therefore God's love used to be here for me, and now it's here. No, it isn't. It's still there. Our sin separates us from God. It doesn't separate God from us. Right? This is God. This is us. If I sin, I'm the one who separates, not him. He doesn't, he doesn't move at all. Sometimes we think, oh, I just sinned. God is just like, oh, forget it. I'm not, I'm not going to look Craig again. He just sinned. Forget it. I'm, it's all done with, I'm all done with him. That's, no, he's still there, but because my sin that I brought upon myself that I chose to do brought condemnation upon me, he, again, Romans 8, 1, we have to know and understand that if we walk according to the Spirit, we're not going to have condemnation, but if we walk according to the flesh, that's when the condemnation comes. So the condemnation makes me guilty, it makes me feel shame, makes me feel lousy, I sin against God, so what do I do? I'm the one who separates from him. Amen? Do you follow me? So in other words, and God is still right there. He loves us, amen? Just like the one time that couple, it was an elderly couple, amen? And they had, you know, they were driving one of those station wagons from years ago. The old station wagons didn't have bucket seats like we have today in many cars. It had a bench seat in the front. You know the bench seats? One big seat. And so what had happened was, as, as the husband, he always took the wheel. He was the one that drove all the time. He's driving on a Sunday afternoon drive. And suddenly the wife looks over to him, who's way over to the right, on the right side of the bench seat, right next to the passenger door. He's behind the wheel. And she looks over at him and says, Honey, how come is it, why is it that we never, ever sit close and cuddle when we're driving like we used to? He looks over at her and says, Honey, I've never moved. It's like, in that analogy, God is the one who's driving. We're the ones that move, not him. 
Somebody say praise God. Amen. God is such an awesome God. I am assured that God works for my all good, me in all circumstances. Let's, let's go. Uh, I'm coming uh, backtracking. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Next, I am hidden with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. It's 1 through 4. It says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Let your minds on things of, set your minds rather on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. How I many you know where our mind is, is how we're going to relate, how we're going to act, and how we're going to do things? So if we set our minds on heavenly things, how I many you know, praise God, that we don't have to worry about the earthly things? Now, if we, if we always think about our problems, oh, tomorrow morning is Monday, i got to wake up at that time, that's right, the boss wants to see me at 11 o'clock, what's he going to say? Oh, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to get the pink slip? What's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know, you know, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I don't know, I'll tell you what, I'm worried about this meeting, I'm worried about meeting with this person, and, and so forth, and... If we keep on thinking that way, we, our worries about tomorrow will steal our joy for today. So you know what to do? Plan, yes, plan for tomorrow. Obviously set your alarm clock or whatever, what time you have to wake up. That's fine, but leave it in God's hands. Enjoy today. Amen? Enjoy today and say, Lord, it's raining outside and i got to drive home after church, but I want to thank you that I have windshield wipers you've blessed me with. Amen? Lord, I want to thank you for the rain because a lot of places it's not raining for a long time and they need rain so bad, but yet we're having it plen plentifully. Amen? Amen. In, the, you know, in the summertime, thank God for rain because God is, is washing all the bugs off your windshield. He's saving windshield washer so you don't have to buy it. There's, two, there's always two ways to look at everything. Amen? Isn't that awesome? God is an awesome God. Amen? I am confident that God will complete the good work he started in me. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he was, who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So that's why we know God started this church, and he ain't going to end this church. He's going to follow it on until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? I am a citizen of heaven. Philippians 3.20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have loved ones that are passed before us, guess what? They're in another planet called heaven just waiting for us. Isn't that good news? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. All right, next. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Somebody say self-discipline. Oh, praise God. So, you know, God did not give you a, a spirit of timidity. You're afraid of people. No, that's not from God. God gave you love, power, in a sound mind or self-discipline. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Are you all understanding these scriptures? Don't you know these are all directed towards each one of us? Individually, amen? And let's close in, I am significant. Somebody say, I am significant. Every person in the earth wants to be significant, every human being. Amen? They want to be significant, amen? I am a branch of Jesus Christ, the true vine, and a channel of his love. John 15 and verse 5, I am the, speak, Jesus speaking, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I have been chosen and appointed of to bear fruit. Somebody say fruit. 
John chapter 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Wow. You can ask for anything in, in the Lord's name. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I am God's temple. First Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? Amen. Somebody say, I'm God's temple. Praise God. We don't have time to go to the scripture, but you can go to it at home if you'd like. But it talks about that I am a minister of reconciliation for God. Minister of reconciliation, meaning that we share the word of God with people and introduce them to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And that's what those scriptures are pointing out. I am seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. Notice it. Listen to the scripture, Ephesians 2 and 6. It says, And God raised up us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now it's present. We're seated. It doesn't say we will be seated. Notice that? It doesn't say after you die you will be seated. We are seated with him in heavenly places. I am God's workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Next, I may, I may approach God with freedom and confidence. Ephesians 3.12. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I am an overcomer. Somebody say I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer in Christ. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says that. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you're an overcomer. Oh, praise God. Amen. I am an overcomer, and not only that, more than a conqueror in Christ. Romans 8.37, yet in all these things, you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Next is, how, how often does God think about you? You think he's too busy today? Well, maybe he's busy up there with Gabriel, and he could be busy, you know. No, God, the Bible says God thinks about you all the time. When you're asleep, he's thinking about you. When you're at work, he's thinking about you. When you're in church right now, he's thinking about you. He's thinking about you and I all the time. Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Amen? How many, you know that, how many of us have hair? Well, some of us have I remember one time I was preaching and I was going to read the scripture and this man in our church, he was totally bald. And I said, how many of us have hair? And he didn't raise his hand. I'm like, whoops. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. How many know the Bible says that Jesus is so close to us, he has numbered every single piece of hair on our head? How many of us know how many pieces of hair we have on our head? Let's see now. I got one, two, three, six hundred. 603. Wait a minute. Did I do 60? Did I count this one? Let me start over again. One, two, three, 680, 681. Did I do 679? Did I count this one? Oh, let, me try it. let me try it again. Then we take a shower, and of course, that number changes. You took a shampoo, you lost a few strands. God knows every second how many hairs you have upon your head. Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Amen. You and I can't even do that. Amen? Amen? But God knows exactly how many hairs on our head we have. That's why he's all excited whenever somebody shaves their head. All right, I don't have to keep track of him. <laughs> Glory to God. No, just kidding. <laughs> you know, I think why Jesus said that, because he wanted us to know that I know more about you than you know about yourself. I know your tomorrow and your next year and the following year and 10 years down the road of your life and you don't know it. Amen? Because he knows us better than, he, than we know ourselves, yet he still accepts us. Isn't that awesome? I am the apple of God's eye. Psalm 17, verse 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. I have been created in his image. Genesis 1 and 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
Notice it doesn't say that you were created in the image of a chimpanzee. You were created in God's image. God's plan for my life are to give me a great future, a great future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. And you can read this scripture, I read it earlier, Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, God loves me unconditionally. Somebody say, He loves me unconditionally. Jesus will never leave nor forsake me, and I will never be abandoned by Him. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Amen. And I love this one. It's the last scripture for today. Somebody say the last scripture for today. Every teardrop I shed, God puts in a bottle and writes it in a book why I shed him. Psalm 56, verses 8 and 9. You keep track of all of my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. My enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. This I know, God is on my side. Amen? How many of you know the Lord loves every one of us? We've got to receive who we are in Christ Jesus. If somebody says to you, you're no good, or they say some negative word about you, you're ugly, or you're this, or you're that, or they judge you, just brush it off. Don't worry about it. Don't receive it. You say, I know that my God loves me, and he is for me. He's not against me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I'm sad and I shed tears, he puts that every tear in a bottle, and he writes it in the book. This tear that Craig shed was tear number 5,286 in his life. And this was because he was sad because of this reason. Amen. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Let's stand and close with the word of prayer. Amen. And here, that last song you don't have to um, put on. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you, Lord. We praise your mighty name for this service today. We thank you, Lord, for us coming out, even though it was raining outside. Lord God, we came out to tell you how much we loved you. We came out to hear your word. Your word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pray for the rest of the congregation, Lord, most of which I do not know what happened. But Lord, I just pray you're with them. If anybody's sick today, I pray you heal them. If anybody's discouraged, I pray that you'd encourage them. I pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you just have your perfect way and will in everybody's heart and life in this church. And Lord, we thank you for that, Father. We love you so much. We know who we are in Christ. Lord, we cannot stand before you one day and say, Lord, I never knew. He'll say, on this day in November, you sat in your church and your pastor went over every single scripture of my word and said exactly what I say about you. So, Lord, I pray that every one of us from pulpit to pew would receive the word of God today of who we are in you. And we thank you for that. We praise you. And in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.